I'm back, bitch. Hey, hi, what's up, you guys? Today we will be talking about The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. Yes, there will be spoilers. The Picture of Dorian Gray is about this man named, well, Dorian Gray and his journey through life. In the opening scene, we meet Dorian Gray posing for a painter named Basil Hallward. Lord Henry joins the session and is introduced to Dorian. Turns out this Mr. Lord Henry, not such a great guy. He uh, has this influence on Dorian and Dorian seems to listen to this guy. He seems to really capture his meaning and sort of copy his take on how to sort of live your own life. Dorian Gray makes some really bad, bad decisions. At the same time, the portrait that Basil made of Dorian reflects Dorian's inner soul and the painting ages and shows his lines, shows the decisions he has made, while Dorian himself actually retains his young appearance. Without a doubt, the characters in this book have a very distinct voice. Lord Henry, I think, has the most distinct voice of them all. And that may be because Lord Henry talks in what now is known as the Wildian epigram. So an epigram means a concise and a clever way to sort of state one's opinion. So Lord Henry does this a lot within the book. He talks about women, he talks about society, about gossip, and how the the, the world sort of surrounds around that and how he feels about these things. One of the examples, for instance, is nowadays people know the price of everything and the value of nothing. Another one is men marry because they are tired. Women marry because they are curious. Both are disappointed. Really, Lord Henry? Really? Lord Henry is very much the archetype of a villain within this story. Within the book, Henry often is called Harry, which is a very often used nickname within English uh, at that time. And it's interesting to note that Old Harry actually means the devil within English. I'm not sure if it's still used today, but it might have been used as sort of a symbolism kind of thing to showcase that this Lord Henry really, you know, is not such a great character. So this Lord Henry talking within these epigrams may not seem like such a big deal right now within the 21st century, because, you know, he's at least speaking his mind, he's being free about his opinion. But at that time, during the 19th century, when this book was actually written, that wasn't such a thing to do, you know? Things were more about keeping the peace, keeping things quiet. So really displaying your own opinion like that was actually really not done. So while it may have actually been ahead of his time, or at least he was writing something that at that time wasn't considered okay. And it of course really advanced Lord Henry to really be like this bad, bad person within the story. But it is interesting to note down that this epigram, this sort of style of writing that really wasn't that common at that time and really didn't sort of suit the um, maintaining the peace within uh, England society in the 19th century. So let's take a look at Dorian Gray's character arc here. I think it's really interesting to note how he has evolved from this really innocent boy to a really dark one, or really like a guy you wouldn't want to meet actually. So he does start out as a really innocent boy at the start of the story. He's young, he meets this Lord Henry, and this Lord Henry really pollutes his mind. So his mind is polluted by this Lord Henry, but his actions also really reflect his mind. So he does a lot of really horrible things. He uh, is not really good to friends that he uh, was actually really good friends with before. And all of these actions do not reflect on him physically, but they do reflect on a painting that Basil made. So Dorian sees the painting every once in a while and he becomes kind of obsessed with it. I think the tipping point for Dorian within his character arc is the death of Sybil Vane, which in itself is actually kind of an interesting name, Vane, Vanity, Dorian's Vanity. When uh, Sybil Vane actually decides to kill herself, based on what Dorian did to her, you know, uh, not accepting her while he did propose to her before, that that action kind of breaks him, I feel. So he tries to redeem himself, he tries to go back to her to sort of settle things again, and he thought he did a horrible thing, and then it turns out she actually 
kill herself, and that sort of seems like a tipping point, like he it breaks something within his soul. A few more things happen, then we skip ahead in time to when Dorian is a bit older. And at this point, Basil visits Dorian. And this is another pivotal moment within Dorian Gray's character arc. So what happens is Dorian gets so angry with Basil that he actually decides to kill him. The interesting thing here within his character arc is that when Sybil Vane died, he was very much centered on, oh, that is horrible, um, she killed herself. When Basil dies, his focus is very much on himself. How can I save myself? How can I make sure that I do not get caught? So this is a really interesting change here. Two people died, but his reaction to these deaths are completely different. Of course, in one instance, he did kill Basil himself, but his response is already so very different from that innocent boy that he was at the beginning of the story. At the very end of the story, he does try to better himself. He goes to Lord Henry and he talks about his actions, uh, about his good deeds, at least he thinks they are good deeds. And Lord Henry points out that they actually are not that great at all, which sort of makes Dorian flip back. And then in the end, he actually kills himself. He stabs the picture. The picture turns back to the young appearance, to this innocent boy captured in a portrait and on the ground is a an old man who actually turns out to be Dorian. So while I've been talking about the character arc, you can also see a lot of the plot elements really fall neatly in line here with this arc. And that is actually a really great skill since Wilde has actually managed to make the plot revolve around the characters. So the characters make choices within the stories that seem very logical to the plot. So it's not the plot guiding the characters, it's the characters guiding the plot. Another really interesting plot element, or at least a writing technique that Wilde uses, is that he lets the readers in on what is about to happen. One really interesting example here is James Vane. So we learn very early on in the story that he will avenge his sister if anything, if any harm befalls her. Wilde lets us in on that, he makes sure that we read that. And even later on, James meets this woman on the street and he tells her that he's about to actually kill Dorian Gray. So we think that we know what's about to happen, you know, James Vane actually will kill Dorian and that will be the end of the story. But then there's a big plot twist, namely that James Vane doesn't actually kill him. It doesn't even come to a fight. It happens so that James Vane gets killed by accident. In terms of setting and world building, of course, the story is set within 19th century England. It is speculative fiction, you know, there are magical elements here. And I think it could even count as magical realism, which may be a very odd modern term for a classic such as this one. When it comes to setting, there are some really interesting points to note down here. First of all, it is really, really interesting to see the words that Wilde uses. He is very descriptive, very poetic. He uses very specific words, very specific verbs. But the description does a little more than that. It actually also reflects how Dorian feels and what he thinks. There are some really interesting examples here, and one of them is when Dorian leaves Sybil Vane to lie on the ground, bawling her eyes out. So he exits the building, and what he passes are evil looking houses, dimly lit street, gaunt black shadowed archways. This already tells us, the readers, a little something about how Dorian feels and what he feels his actions have actually cost. They are black, they are gone, they are not good. So this also happens when Dorian has killed Basil. What he sees when he goes out is a sky like a monstrous peacock's tail, starred with a myriad of golden eyes. So that is really specific. So I feel like these eyes really symbolize that he feels he is being watched. He feels like people are going to find out that he has actually committed this murder. Another piece of description here is the crimson spot of a prowling handsome. A crimson spot. 
that is so specific. He has killed Basil and he sees a crimson spot. It really does reflect on the murder he has just committed. So this is really interesting. Oscar Wilde uses this description to sort of give the readers some insight on what Dorian actually is thinking without going, Dorian thought that he did something horrible committing this murder, which honestly wouldn't be as interesting to read. A final note on this is the words that Dorian himself, or at least within his voice, uses when he talks about the dead Basil. He talks about the thing on the table. That is a very specific wording that sort of shows that Dorian doesn't really want to admit it or at least wants to ignore it. It has not happened. It is a thing on a table. So these descriptions immediately give away something about the style of Oscar Wilde. He uses very poetic language, a sky like a peacock's tail. Whoever thinks of using that, it is very unique and it really paints a picture. See what I did there? Another style element that is interesting to talk about is Oscar Wilde's use of alliteration. There was one sentence specifically that I underlined that I thought was really interesting. It goes, metaphors as monstrous as orchids and as subtle in color. Metaphors as monstrous as orchids and as subtle in color. There's a lot of emphasis here on the O and the R, and I think that is just beautifully done. You know, it is not too much on the nose. It's not an L and an L and an L, but it's this O-R that sort of comes back in different orders and within different words. So in the whole, I do think that Oscar Wilde has a lot of interesting elements within his book. He really has written something beautiful here, and I absolutely loved every single page. I thought it was a really interesting story, especially coming from that time. I would also, for those of you who are interested in buying a physical copy, really recommend this edition. It is the Alma Classics edition. And the reason why I'm saying that is because it has many notes in the back of the book. So it has little stars throughout the text and you can go to the back of the book and there are a lot of explanation on the intertextuality within the book. And that is really interesting to read on. There's also a lot of description on Oscar Wilde, his life, um, what he did, uh, why he was so revolutionary for his time, especially when it comes to aestheticism, which is art for art's sake. Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you found it insightful and thought there were some interesting points here that I mentioned. If you have any other notes on storytelling within the picture of Dorian Gray, do feel free to note them down in the comments or discuss them with me. I'm always interested to look into what stories do to us and really get into the nitty gritty details of a story. Thank you very much guys and I will see you next time. Bye!